Hi, Paul Coker here from OneBloodyDrop.com. On the previous video, I was talking with Dr. Andrews about how you manage your diabetes before aerobic exercise. And in this video, I'm with Dr. Andrews and he's going to be sharing with us how you manage your diabetes during aerobic exercise. So just for those that haven't seen the first video, uh, Dr. Andrews, could you just give us a quick introduction of your phenomenal expertise in diabetes and exercise? So um, I'm Dr. Rob Andrews. I'm a, a, a physician who works in, with people with diabetes uh, in a district hospital, so Taunton. Um, and I, as well as taking care of people who've, who've got type 1 diabetes, I see people who are coming up to do sporting events, such as marathons and things, or people who are doing sports at an elite level and try and give them advice to, to help them manage their, their blood sugars uh, before and during and after. And to aid with that, we have a research program that's run through the University of Exeter that we try and answer questions to make that advice better with time. Thanks, Rob. Um, the work that you're doing is just incredible, and, and I know that I've benefited from it. And by sh us sharing some of your knowledge on this video, I'm hoping that we can get some of your fantastic knowledge out to a much wider community. So thank you for joining mm -hmm. us today. Um, so the, the previous video, we were talking about how you manage your diabetes before you do aerobic exercise. And in this video, I'd like to talk about what you should do to manage your diabetes during aerobic exercise, or, or rather, what you, rather than what you should do, what the research suggests is a, a useful strategy for managing diabetes during exercise, because of course, what works for me may not work for the next patient. And, and I think there's a, an element here where I can find a method that works for me and somebody else could try that exact same method. It wouldn't necessarily work for them and, and they would need to refine it. Yeah, so, so I think you're right. Um, exactly what you said is, is that it's very personal what works for certain people. One way of, of, of changing the variance that some people see um, with, so some people find if they do the same exercise, they get a different response each time they do the exercise, is to think about whether it's worth doing it fasted so we know from research that if you do your blood sugar, if you do your exercise before breakfast in the morning, that actually the response you get with whatever exercise you do for you is pretty consistent. Whereas if you're exercising at other times of the day, there's lots of other things going on, stress of work, when you last ate, when you last took your, your bonus insulin, and that means that you could have a, a very varied response, even though you think you've cracked it one time having done it before. So that's one tip that I would say if you want to try and decrease your variance is think about whether you do that fasted. Okay, that, that's really interesting because if you look at all of the sports material out there, everybody tells you, oh, you should be um, loading with food before you exercise and to actually exercise fasting is not recommended in the mainstream literature. For, now, how much science is based on the mainstream literature, I honestly don't know. Um, but I, I find it absolutely fascinating because my preferred strategy for going for a run is to get up first thing in the morning and run before breakfast. Um, for me personally, I experience a severe amount of insulin resistance in the morning uh, because of a, a variety of hormones that are flying around in my body. And actually going for a 30 minute run, I actually managed to negate all of those insulin resistant hormones without having a huge dose of insulin. And that means that I'm then going through the whole morning period and getting to lunchtime without going hypo. Whereas if I try to manage those insulin resistant episodes with increased insulin by lunchtime, I'm battling hyperglycemia. So for me, I find it an essential part of my diabetes management toolkit. Um, but we, we're going on a slight tangent here. So I, I'd like to actually talk about what you actually do during an exercise session. So do, doing it in a fasted state is, is one strategy, but of course you my own opinion would be that you need to make sure that you've got fast acting carbohydrates around in case you do go hyperglycemic. If you've not eaten for the last 12 hours, you may be at risk if you're on the running machine for 20 minutes. Um, so I, I think that that for, for me would be one thing I, I would recognize from my own experiences. And um, what, what other recommendations would you have? Yeah, so starting with just what you were talking about with safety. So it's really important when people are thinking about 
doing exercise that, that, that they have the kit with them that they, they, they need. And, and part of that kit, as you already said, is that they should have some carbo fast acting carbohydrate. Obviously they should have some fluid. They should have an ability of, of actually uh, testing their blood sugars. Um, and we, if you're out doing events that you're not around people, then we would suggest that if possible, have a mobile phone. You know, so, so, so that you can do things, and of course, have something to identify that you've got diabetes uh, for people. So it's worth doing that. I think sometimes people get slightly upset that they say, "Well, with type one diabetes, I have to really plan my event." If you talk to most people who do exercise, if they don't, they don't have type one diabetes. They have to do all of those. They carry a phone round, they carry some food round, they carry fluid round, and they they do have contact ability. So it's not actually that much that's different. Just that you're more reliant on having enough food around. I, I think in my own case, the additional things that I carry are my insulin pump yep. and my blood glucose testing equipment. Now, I'm usually lucky enough to be running with a CGM, which actually connects to my phone. So that means that it's only really my insulin pump that's in addition. Um, I think that the frustration for me is, is on a long run is just the amount of equipment that I have to carry in terms of blood glucose, uh, sorry, not blood glucose te testing, the amount of extra um, fuel that I have to carry because it's not just about, um, I, I might want to eat a couple of jelly babies every half an hour to keep me going. It, it tends to be a little bit more complicated than that. Yeah, so it certainly plenty does. In terms of what, in the previous video, and it's worth watching the previous video, we talked about what you can do of the strategies before you start. So one of the strategies you might have done before was reduce your insulin. And if you've done that during the event, you might find actually that you hardly need to take any, any carbohydrate or do anything with your exercise to help with your blood sugar. Um, if you do need to do something in the event, you've only got two choices. One of them is that you take some food because actually what's happening is that your glucose is falling and you're not, your body's not able to keep up with the rate that it's falling, so you've got to take something in order to level that out so it doesn't keep falling. And that's when you're talking about fast-acting carbohydrates. Or the other thing that you could do is you can fool the body into actually saying, I'm doing a different event, I need to produce the hormones that, that will push up my blood sugar. So what we know is if you're doing a, a, an aerobic event that's continuous, if you introduce little sprints in them, and there used to be something called fartlets, which is that you would, you would run in a line, when you get to the, to, to the back of the line, you have to sprint to the front of the line. Um, that sprint is enough to raise your hormones and prop up your, your blood sugars. So during an event, if, you, if, you, if you're trying to lose weight during, during training and things, you can intermittently during an aerobic event do a little sprint and that will help prop up your blood sugar so it doesn't fall. Does, does that continue to work? So if you, if you do that once, it will make you the, the other hormones will make you slightly insulin resistant. If you do it a second time, does it have the same level of effect? Uh, and so if you're doing it once, twice, three times, four times over the course of an event, can you rely on it being as effective each time? Um, we, we haven't done as much research as, as we would like into that, but the, the small amount of research suggests that, that there is a little diminishing effect, um, but that it still is effective. And certainly for on kid holidays, when we do kid holidays and things, just if they're doing activity holidays, what we do is just stop them and ask them to do a couple of sprints, and that's protected through the day of actually keeping up their blood sugar. Protective through the day, so not, not just for the next five minutes or ten minutes, but for the entire day? It, so it can, it can last for, for two or three hours, the, the, the effect of the sprint. I think the pe things that people worry about, and we're probably going to talk about that in, in, in another video, is what happens afterwards is that if you do sprints um, as part of your aerobic, you're burning more of your muscle glucose stores. And the thing that predicts whether you're going to have a low blood sugar overnight is how much of your blood stores that, that, that you predict. So the way I kind of try to say to people is a bit like a credit card, is that during the event you are spending stuff that you have to give back. So you're using the fuels in your body. At some point the body's going to say, hey mate, you owe me what I gave you and you have to replenish that if you don't replenish that then there are penalties and those penalties are the low blood sugars excellent I, I love that analogy about the credit card that makes so much sense um, it, it just makes it suddenly so very simple to think about in, in terms of uh, I've been out for a run I've burned all of these calories and even though I may wish to lose some weight 
I can't just let that calorie deficit continue because my, my body requires more than the calories. Those muscles and my liver want to get the um, carbohydrate stores back. Uh, and so that's a really nice, simple way to think about it. I, and uh, yeah. yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so would there be any other tips that you would share um, that, that you can think of or would they be your, your key principles? So the, the, uh, the key principle are, are regular carbohydrates and I think I think people sometimes what they want to do and it used to be the old adage is why it's called a, a fun Mars bar is that is that people used to be told just have a Mars a fun size Mars bar before and go off and have some fun what we don't like to do is is to actually um, load you with carbohydrates at the start because I think people think if they've got to start with a high blood sugar it protects them from being full it doesn't if it's very high it easily moves into the cell so it drops much quicker if it's high so what we want you to do is take a small amount frequently and, yep. and what appears to be the ideal thing is take something every 20 minutes. So take a small amount every 20 minutes. Uh, and it's something that we didn't really talk about on the previous video, and perhaps we should have. Is there a, an upper limit of your blood glucose level when you should consider not performing exercise? Yes, there is. And, and, and luckily, we finally got it agreed worldwide. So there used to be different figures that were, were in different parts of the world. We now all agree that if your blood sugar is above 15, that you sh you should be checking for ketones and that's blood ketones not urine ketones because urine ketones are, are, are too late if you can't check for, for blood ketones so lots of people don't have blood ketone monitors then we would say what you need to do is is to is to think about a correction or just wait and see whether it falls but don't exercise if it's above uh, um, 15 if you do have a a a tester then what we want you to do is is really not do anything if if, if the ketones are above one um, um, apart from low-grade exercise um, and, and there's a lot of debate about that we generally say don't do anything if it's if, if you've got any ketones at all to be safe but okay. obviously there are elite and, athletes who and can you just share with us what the dangers are of us exercising if our blood glucose levels are too high or we do have ketones so what the if the blood sugars are high what that suggests is is that you at that point are slightly under insulinized so you've not got enough insulin around because if you had enough insulin around you'd expect the, the, the glucose to be lower um, and it, it means that when you do exercise there are two ways of getting the glucose into the cell one is the exercise induced but there is but you still everyone who exercises who hasn't got type 1 diabetes still keeps a small amount of insulin around so that you can have insulin that takes the, the glucose into the cell if you're missing that then what can happen is you don't take up as much of the glucose that's being produced by the liver particularly if you're doing anaerobic when you're pouring out the glucose and what can happen is the glucose just keeps going up as you're exercising and then you can run into problems with with ketosis and and things yeah if your blood glucose levels are, are really high the last thing you want to do is to give them another excursion even higher and i think i think from the when we talk to people who are trying to do things to the best that they can do people always think about the low and that that that, that, that doesn't perform but what we know is that for there there seems to be a a perfect spot for each event but if you're doing coordination events and your blood sugar is about 12 the coordination will go off um, so actually the higher end is just as bad for doing the sport well as the lower end so for, for us to perform at our best regardless of the sport it seems that we actually need to manage our blood glucose levels within that tight bandwidth of between 7 and 12 yeah um, and I think that's absolutely consistent with my own findings of, of my own performance in different sporting events. Um, I, I know for a fact that I've run half marathons with my blood glucose levels being very, very high um, because of adrenaline surges at the start line and a, and a variety of effects. And actually my performance on those particular events has been greatly reduced over my typical performance. Um, so I, I think that it's really important that we actually get to a point where we can exercise safely with a good starting blood glucose level and that we don't uh, carbohydrate load or, or reduce our insulin too much so that so that we get a high blood glucose level as you were talking about just now uh, I, I find that that is a, a, a world of, of pain both physically and in terms of my performance yeah, and I think you've come, come across something, I'm not sure if we're, we're going to talk about that, but the, the, the prime problem that, that, that people get really worried about is how to manage a high blood sugar before an event. Doing an event is completely different from training. 
Yes, it really is. And, and actually, it's a good point to be talking about that because I know that I, I did 40 half marathons in a year and I did lots and lots of training before the very first one. And in fact, I'd, I'd run a number of half marathons and, and on a training run, my blood glucose level and my diabetes would behave in one way and I'd get to an event and it behaves in an entirely different way. And I think it's really important for us to understand that there is a difference. So what might be causing that to happen? What, why, why is it different on the day when I go to a, a big race compared to the day when I go out and run 12 miles on my own? I think there's, well, there's a number of reasons, but the, the two main reasons are, are one that the people who organize events don't think of the participants, they think about how they're gonna get it to do with the traffic and, and all those things. So sometimes the events aren't ideally placed in terms of time, that, that, that it can be a, a nine o'clock start or sometimes an earlier start. And that makes it very difficult to, to, to have the normal pattern that you would have had of having the breakfast at the normal time. And, and then, so, so there's an added complexity that you're adding into that. And then the other thing is that, you, that you're nervous being around people makes you nervous, so you produce more of the, the nervous hormones that you were talking about, so the adrenaline, the noradrenaline, and that stops the insulin working as well, makes you a bit insulin resistant and pushes the blood sugars up. Um, Excellent. And what we try and say to people is, is if it, you're going to do an event like that, try and get exposed to that and, and see what that does. I'm not saying do a marathon before you do a marathon. Um, what we're really lucky about is, is that there are park runs, so you can go to a park run have a little go as to what happens in that first 20, 25 minutes and you can have a, like, a number of goes and you will get the effect of lots of people being around you getting slightly stressed that you're doing a run. Uh, and I think that's really good actually. I, I, I do uh, regularly go to my local park run and I, I run it um, and there's a whole community out there of park run with diabetes which I'm uh, an advocate of and I support. Um, and a park run is, is absolutely brilliant because as you say it's 25 to 30 minutes now my own experience of running is that i can go out and i can run and i know from my cgm trace results that for 24 minutes my blood glucose levels are absolutely stable i get to 24 minutes and they start to drop and it happens like clockwork every single time i know that at 24 minutes of running my blood glucose levels are going to start falling and if i run beyond 24 minutes they're going to continue falling and so i know if I'm going to be running for more than about 30 minutes, I need to be thinking about carbohydrate loading at 20 minutes. Um, and, and that's for me personally, I'm not suggesting that's the same for everybody out there, but if somebody out there is starting to participate in, in running or cycling, it might be a, a strategy they wish to try. I'm not suggesting it will work for everybody, but... Um, yeah, I think that's... I, Probably an entirely different subject, but that, that brings up about how do you use your continuous glucose monitor when you're exercising. Yeah. Um, continuous glucose monitors weren't made for, 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 for noticing very quick changes. And, and the trouble is that as you start to exercise, there's a cooling of the skin and then an increase of the temperature of the skin. So what we say to people is the first 20 minutes, actually, your CGMS is going to take time to find out where your blood sugars are. So that's when you're running blind. And what you need to do is if you're doing an aerobic event, think that the blood sugars are likely to fall and take something. And then once you've got past the, the 20 minute point, then you can start looking at the continuous glucose monitor, but still remember there's a delay. So if it's saying, I, I always say to people, if it's saying six, then you need to be taking something because actually it's four. Yep. <laughs> so, so it's just a question of just learning that, that with that and there are some nice algorithms that are out there that kind of say what to do with each, each blood sugar depending on what type of continuous glucose monitor you use. Okay, well perhaps we can uh, put those algorithms, are, are they on the web? On yeah, the internet? yeah. So perhaps what we can do is find out what they are and put them on the, yeah. the footer of the video uh, for, for people. So I think we've covered an awful lot in that video about exercise and managing type 1 diabetes uh, for aerobic exercise and we've probably gone a little bit off the off the track there but once again Dr Andrews thank you for sharing your incredible knowledge mm -hmm. and uh, we're going to do another video where we will be talking about how to manage your diabetes after aerobic exercise and I think that this one is really really important because when you go and exercise you already made the analogy earlier of a, a credit card and a debt that needs to be repaid. And if we don't repay that debt, it's going to lead almost certainly to hyperglycemia in the hours in recovery. So I'm really excited to be shooting the next video with you where we'll be talking about how to prevent that from happening.